Have you got a 3D printer but don't know what to make? Well, you're in luck because today I'm offering six 3D printing based projects that offer education and entertainment for little kids and big kids alike. At this time of year, my kids are on an extended school holiday and it's not long before they announce that they're bored. So to combat this, I've been looking for projects that I can include them in. In this video, I'm gonna to present to you six different projects that I've come across on the internet that I couldn't resist trying myself. They do scale in difficulty, so we're gonna rate each one in terms of how hard it is to print, how much assembly is required, what additional parts of knowledge are required, and of course, what they offer once they're complete. And along the way, I'll point out anything that I found out that will increase your chances of success if you choose to build them. We're gonna start with something very simple, but also very fun. This balance game by Jan Lagarde. These are the four areas we're going to evaluate each project. And for this balance game, 3D printing is very easy. There's no assembly outside of actually playing the game, no additional hardware needed, and beyond learning how to use a 3D printer, this game is great for teaching people about center of gravity. If we look on the Thingiverse page, we have a range of files to print, and we simply need to print each file once, as they have a pair of matching parts included in the STL. All of them are simple prints as well, and the majority don't even use much filament. You'll notice that most of the files are labelled with a colour, and it doesn't really matter which colour you use, the important thing is that each set of pieces is a different colour, because when setting up the game, your first job is to divide all of the pieces between the two players, so each one has one of each colour. The first piece to go down is this base, and as you can see, it has a curve on the bottom and can rock from side to side. Players then take turns, adding a piece, going back and forward, seeing if they can add to an inherently unstable structure. Eventually, a player will make a move where one or more pieces fall down, ending the game with them as the loser. My kids and I had a lot of fun playing this against each other, with my son in particular being quite reckless in the placement of his pieces. Perhaps this was from my influence, because every time I played with them, I sacked the pieces on one side on purpose to try and make them nervous. This game is highly recommended. Let's up the complexity to projects that do need some assembly, but these ones are entirely 3D printed, which means you don't need to buy any extra parts. Next up, we have this mobile exosuit by Jajom 3 d and as soon as I saw this, I knew I just had to make it. We step up the difficulty a little bit with this model as it has print in place geometry with some pretty skinny parts that like to peel off the bed. However, assembly is quick and easy and we only need the parts that we print. This one is good for seeing the one that is print in place and learning about rack and pinion and spur gears. There are four plates of parts in total and you should print the armor plate in a different color to the rest. For me, the arms were the hardest to print as the first layer doesn't have a huge contact patch and these narrow sections like to peel off the bed. Fortunately, there's some great tips for this on the printables page, and I followed this to great success by adding a bunch of little discs that overlapped the narrow areas, increasing the contact patch and stopping the peeling. I assembled this one with the help of my daughter, and there was only one step that I found difficult, putting on the forearm armor without it colliding with the elbow. There's an animation specifically showing how this is done, but I found it a little too fast and it took me quite a few goes until I could replicate the process but eventually we persevered and continued with the rest of the assembly. We found the clearances to be spot on and the parts have a satisfying snap as you put them together. My daughter and I did an arm and a leg each before I did the final assembly of all of the components. And here is the finished project. As you can see, the print in place gears move back and forth as we expand or contract the width and they're also connected to some turbines which we can see from the rear. To use this, we expand to full width place our phone on the holder, and then close the body to clamp. We can then plug in a charging cable in the bottom, or if you're not using it, put it in the hand on either side. There's plenty of phone stands around, but in my opinion, this has got to be one of the coolest. Next up, this printable jointed dummy 13 figure by Sousaphone. For me, this pushed the boundaries of what I thought was possible from an articulated 3D printed object. When it comes to printing, bed adhesion might be a factor as the parts are quite small, but for a beginner, the main challenge might be that around half the parts can't be from PLA. So if that's all you've ever done, you're going to need to branch out. Assembly, thanks to an included instructional video, is quite straightforward, but the parts are quite small, so steady hands are required. There's no additional hardware needed. In terms of what can be learned, 
you'll see how PLA and other filaments material properties differ and I also think this is a great object for a budding artist or animator to pose and position to try out different expressions through body language. When it comes to printing we have a table on printables giving us some tips but the most important is to print the plate with all of the body parts from a filament besides PLA. I originally made a mistake by not paying attention to this and as the instructions warned they started to split so I had to reprint them from PETG. For the armor parts it can be whatever filament you like and I went for a pretty PLA. One reason I was drawn to this project are the excellent included video instructions embedded on printables. Not only do they do a great job of showing exactly what parts are needed at what time, but they show the entire assembly step by step, so if you're careful you should be almost guaranteed success. Again, my daughter and I enjoyed building this project together. I would collect the armor parts, she would collect the body parts, and then we would work together to assemble them. Because of that, she got to name the figurine. Therefore, I present to you, Hans Maximus Julian Moleman. I'd like to demonstrate how good this figurine is at striking a pose. Firstly, as my daughter is demonstrating here, each joint has a huge range of motion. For instance, the shoulders and hips rotate as well as pivoting up and down, the elbows and knees bend as you would expect, and we also have articulation in the neck, torso, wrists and ankles. Because of the creative freedom this figurine allows, my daughter took quite a liking to it and started a little game. Every time she went past my studio, she would secretly take the figurine and style it into a new pose. Just like Elf on the Shelf, each day I would return to discover what Hans Maximus Julian Moleman was up to. She likes the figurine so much, she's asked me to print a second one as a companion. Who knows where this will end up once we double the potential posing. And as the description says, we are spoilt for choice when it comes to that. Because Sousaphone also has Lucky 13, Mini 13 and Easy 13. And each of these has an enormous amount of remixes that you can use to further customise. Perhaps my favourite being this Lucky 13 butt by Pedro Lopez. Moving on to number 4, we have this toroidal launcher by Brent Peterson. To print this, you'll need good accuracy and tight control over clearances. The assembly is intermediate and as we mentioned, there's no additional hardware required. This project is the perfect way to learn about planetary gears, but also the aerodynamic performance of toroidal blades. I'd just like to note how cleverly this is designed, with a compliant mechanism used to hinge the outer sections, allowing them to remain one piece and still close over the gears inside. For assembly, all we need to do is scroll down the page on Maker World, and we have a series of animated GIFs that go through step by step for each stage. After printing, the first thing you should do is check that the planetary gears rotate freely. I made two of these, and the first one I did was pretty slow going, as I worked carefully through the steps. But the second one, I knew exactly what I was doing, and I managed to complete the entire thing from start to end in 4 minutes. For the smoothest operation, it's also worth using some lubricant for the shaft of the smallest gears. I used some light machine oil, and it seemed to work really well. The reason I wanted to print two was to try out some of the remixes. I didn't try any of the other ratio gearboxes, but the second design used the smaller 100mm mini rings. The mini rings actually use a different size center mounting to the original, meaning that the two aren't compatible, so using different colors for each is probably a good idea. Operation is very satisfying. A little bit of rotation on the bottom translates to a very fast rotation on the top. With a simple short sharp twist, these things launch really well. The bigger one doesn't go as high, but stays in the air for longer, and the smaller one goes much higher, but also comes down faster. The mini rings with less blades are really easy to launch quite high so I would recommend those for smaller kids. Speaking of kids, my two had mixed results, but they were a massive hit with my son. These also work very well horizontally, and they fly quite straight. To finish off, let's explore two more sophisticated projects that combine 3D printing with electronics. The first came from a video by fellow YouTuber James Bruton to demonstrate smooth servo motion, and luckily for us, all of the code in CAD is published on GitHub. For this one, the actual printing isn't hard, the only consideration being a bit of support material, but as you'll see, the part prep will require some work. The actual assembly is not very hard, but to get it working you will need to be familiar with Arduino, and you will need to do some soldering. And unlike the other projects, we will need a fair amount of hardware, including an Arduino Uno to run everything, servos for the face, and joysticks for the controller. However, this would be an awesome project to run in a school. Those who build it will learn about control systems and integrated electronics, and then the finished result can be used for puppeteering afterwards. Onto printing, and most of the parts really aren't that hard. 
The trouble comes when we look at the CAD provided and find that we only have a single step file to work with. Most slicers will import this, but as you'll see, everything is assembled in place. So you'll need to right click on the part and then split to objects to divide the individual parts. This will break them down into sub-assemblies. So we'll need to repeat the process again, breaking those down even further. Some of the parts can be deleted, such as the servos, which were placeholders in the CAD. You'll also need to go through part by part, orienting the objects so they sit flat on the bed. Eventually, you'll have all of the parts broken down. You can divide them into plates and assign colors. But before you hit print, check the parts as some will need a small amount of support material. For assembly, the only reference is the original video. So I watched each segment one at a time and tried to match what I could see on screen. This is tricky for some parts, but eventually through trial and error, the whole thing came together. Assembled, but useless without electronics. For control, the project uses these three axis joysticks, and I reckon I paid way too much for these, but I went for a local company that would ship quickly, and I was also keen to have the instructions for wiring. In James's video, we see a 3D printed housing for the joysticks, but as we know, in the CAD section, there's only a file for the head. However, James has a lot of other robotic projects, so I explored those on GitHub and found a remote file that I could use as a basis for my own design. In its stock form, it was far too complicated for what I needed, so I remixed it. I removed any unwanted openings, put mounting lugs for an Uno on the bottom, I cut out for wiring on the back, and generally shrunk things down as much as I could to save on print time and filament. As we can see, the Uno is tucked neatly inside, and the two joysticks bolt nicely to the top surface. The final component is the shield I made for my Uno, which will require some soldering. I started with a shield with a 5V and ground rail, and that's because the 7 servos and 2 joysticks all require 5 volts and ground. There's a third row for the signals for the servos, and they're just connected on the underside to the digital pins. The 6 signal wires from the 2 joysticks then plug directly into the analog inputs. To power this, I have a dedicated 5 volt power supply with a connector that matches the jack on the Uno, and then I bridged the 5 volt and voltage in lines so this regulated 5 volt source powers everything. I could now tuck all of the wires in neatly and bolt the lid down. The final step is the code and the version we want is Puppet. Firstly, let's examine the code and from line 34, I managed to trace what servo connects to what in the actual face. Next, correcting the inputs from the joysticks, which I plugged in at random. We'll make our adjustments in the first part of the loop and any inputs that are in reverse, you can correct by adding 1023 minus to the start. As for the order, you can see mine are quite jumbled, normally going from one to six. And here's what I did to work that out. If you run the serial monitor while everything is powered up, you'll see there's a constant stream of data from the output of the six joysticks. The left joystick currently moves the eyeballs from side to side, and we can see the second column's value changing when I move the joystick. I want that to be assigned to twist however, and when I twist that joystick back and forth, I can see the third column is a value that's changing. I want these two inputs switched, so all I do is come to the pot section and swap numbers 2 and 3. Alternatively, you can change where they're plugged in, but I found this easier. Once you save your changes and upload them to the Uno, the changes you want should be in effect, and if you do this one input at a time, you'll have everything mapped to the joysticks correctly. Finally, my eyelids were working in reverse. So I found the relevant section and modified the code to use the map function to invert the values. Puppeteer time, and this is something I need a lot of practice with, but let me tell you, it is so much fun trying. We can turn the eyeballs from left to right, widen and close the eyelids, tilt the head forward and back, side to side, and rotate the whole thing at the neck. This project was quite involved, but I feel this is a really good reward for all of my effort. Thanks to James Bruton for such a great project. My last project, and for me by far the most involved, is this hand crank electricity generator by fellow YouTuber Tom Stanton. Almost all the details you need to recreate this yourself has been posted by Tom on printables. In terms of printing, all of the parts are simple enough, but they are large and will require some time. For me, the assembly was the most advanced out of everything here, and you will be doing a fair amount of wiring and electronics. Additional hardware is extensive with copper wire, nuts, bolts and screws, magnets and other electronics. You would never make this to save money. The reason you build this is for fun and education, as you'll learn about alternating to direct current conversion, electricity generation, how to wind your own coils and also gearing. Like the animatronic face, this would be an incredible project to run in a school. The instructions on printables are detailed but brief, and there's a few things I'll point out that I had to discover myself. 
The majority of the parts only need one copy printed. Those that need more will cover soon. When all of your parts are done, it's going to look something like this. And when you've got your hands on the other components, you'll be ready to proceed with assembly. Like with the last project, I referenced the video for assembly instructions, spying the locations of bearings and other components until I knew how everything went together. Fitment of components like the bearings was very tight, so I used a little persuasion with a 3D printed mallet. And once they were in, I completed a dummy assembly to ensure everything was moving smoothly. Regarding the spacers, there's a single small spacer in between the crank and the bearing. The thickest of the large spacers goes on the backside of the first magnetic plate. This rests on the bearing of the stator plate and prevents the two from rubbing together once everything is turning. And then we have one more spacer in between that central bearing and the second magnetic plate. The thickness of the spacer will differ depending on how thick your coils are. Use the thinnest one you can that prevents them from rubbing. Like Tom's video states, you need to alternate north and south for each magnet. So I ensured I got that spot on by using this additional magnet with the poles marked. I would glue one magnet into place, test which pole was facing up, and then position the next magnet to be the opposite of that. And once they were all glued in, I could double check with each odd number magnet attracting and each even number magnet repelling. Onto the coils, there's 8 in total and each is made up of these templates, so you'll need 16 of those in total. I recommend drilling out the center with a 3mm drill bit. There's also the template stiffness. I recommend printing two of those, but only drilling out one of them to 3mm. This will give you an accurate way to align and glue together the two halves of the template. These M3 bolts go through everything cleanly, except the left hand plate, where they cut their own thread, clamp the center together until the glue dries. When this is bolted together is the best time to wind the coils, and I thought I was doing okay until I realized I had tangled the spool badly. So I spent far too long trying to streamline the process, designing and printing an adapter for a drill, putting on a small piece of reflective tape, and using that with an optical tachometer to count the total amount of turns. And this made my day because it was incredibly efficient. My daughter would hold the tachometer and keep me updated on the total, which freed up both of my hands to turn the drill and guide the copper into position using a glove. And that got me eight pretty uniform coils, but I did wire too many loops on. When it came time to glue them in, some of them fitted quite well, but other coils that hadn't been wound as neatly didn't really fit without really forcing them in. This meant that the thickness of the stator subassembly was much thicker than it should have been, and I had to get creative in the slicer by using a negative volume to make a simple little spacer that was needed for the final assembly to avoid having a large gap in between the two halves. I also should have used a large spool of copper like Tom, as buying enough smaller ones to manage 8 coils was not very cost effective. Regarding the winding, you'll get more current if you use thicker copper wire and if you put the coils in parallel, and you'll produce a higher voltage by having more coil loops and putting the coils in series, and both of these will improve with more magnets and magnets of higher quality. Because my priority was 5 volt phone charging but at low RPM, I ended up putting all of my coils in series and we can see the top of one is soldered to the bottom of the next to form a big daisy chain. That simplified things by only having two terminals to connect to the rest of the system. That fed into my full bridge rectifier, which then fed into the voltage meter, capacitors, and the output plug in parallel. I hoped I would have enough current because I was using thicker 0.63 millimeter copper wire instead of the 0.4 in the original video. At a pretty moderate speed, I could hit eight or nine volts. With a medium speed, I was hitting around 13 or 14, and if I tried to go as fast as I could, I could briefly hit around 23 or 24 volts. It's also worth noting that I tried this Serpentine Coil Stator Remix, but with this design, I just couldn't get enough coils in place and the output voltage was much lower. So how does this go in its current configuration? We can directly power a geared DC motor and the faster we crank, the faster it turns. When connected to this beefier 12 volt DC motor, it's physically harder to turn the crank but once we get above a minimum voltage threshold, it comes to life and turns, although not as good as it would from a proper 12 volt source. Ultimately, my aim was to be able to charge my phone without cranking very hard, and we definitely succeeded with that. I might reconfigure the coils in the future, but for now, I'm very satisfied. So thanks to Tom Stanton for the great project. That's the end of my list, but I'm sure you have your own great suggestions. So please head to the comment section and put down your favorite free 3D printed base projects. Personally, I really enjoyed making these, my kids enjoyed helping me, and I hope there's at least one here that you can make yourself. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. 
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you wanna see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really wanna support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.